All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, the book we ought to consider this evening is one of the most mysterious, I suppose, that has been written in modern times. It presents a riddle more difficult than the most scientifically contrived mystery. And even after the perspective of more than a hundred years, most of the relevant facts remain unknown to us. Sometimes we do find one of these episodes in which truth is stranger than fiction, and that is the problem we have with the story of alchemy as it has been unfolded in the writings of Mary Atwood. Perhaps the best way to start the situation is, as the average reader must approach it, by the consideration of the book itself. It is the only known literary production of its author. Uh, the story of the book is one of the most curious, I suppose, in the annals of literature. It was written by a young woman with not, without any known background for this type of undertaking, yet so thoroughly is the work established that we cannot regard it as merely a mystical production. There is no evidence whatever that the author achieved the book by some metaphysical means. It is simply the work of a very interesting and precocious young woman under most unusual circumstances. Mary Ann South was born in 1817, the daughter of a country gentleman, Thomas South, of comfortable means and naturally serious and inquiring mind. South had evidently been uh, quite a student of hermetic arts, alchemy, mesmerism, and psychic phenomena. This in itself was unusual in his time, for it is also known that he was a very devout member of the Anglican Communion. He was a stout, orthodox member of the Church of England. It would not be natural to assume that a man with as strong an orthodoxy as South possessed would have deviated very far from traditional attitudes and thoughts. But he definitely did deviate. And this is the beginning, perhaps, of the riddle that must later uh, be solved in one way or another. From the early childhood, Mary Ann South was the almost constant companion of her father. Uh, it seemed as though they were one soul in two bodies. Their interests were almost identical. The younger girl, having a precocity to attain a scholarship equal to that of her father. By the time she was 15 or 16 years old, she was deep in the things that most concerned him. By the time she was 20, she was his secretary. By the time she was 30, she was his intellectual equal. And they discussed their common interests together, uh, devoting most of their time to this particular phase of activity. Uh, they lived in a grand old house, a large part of which had been transformed into a library. Here South had accumulated perhaps one of the finest collections in private possession dealing with the subjects of his interests, alchemy and hermetic arts. 
We have in our own library here several volumes from the South Collection with his book plate and often with either his notations or those of his daughter. So it is said that uh, when the young woman was about 30 years old, they hit upon a very strange project. They both decided to do a book unfolding the mystery of alchemy. They each decided that it would be a separate production in which neither one would assist the other in any way. Both would have access to the same research material, but there would be no discussion whatsoever of their individual labors while the work was in progress. The establishment was sufficiently large so that quarters were set up for the two industrious workers. We each had a study. Each was able uh, to have access to the general library. Each labored according to their own time and interest. And there was to be no comparing of notes, uh, no effort at common discussion until the projects were completed. This was rather an unusual arrangement, but it worked out very well. Uh, also, oddly enough, uh, Mary decided to handle the material on the level of prose scholarship, and her father decided to write a poem. Uh, this, you might have suspected, would be the other way around, but this is the way they did it. They both worked long and arduously on their specially self-assigned tasks. And Mary was the first to finish the work uh, which she had set out for herself. Now comes another interesting point. Without question, without seeing the manuscript, without going over any part of it or asking any details about it, Mr. South immediately made arrangements for the publication of his daughter's book. The task of publication was entrusted to a responsible English publishing firm. And uh, we may suspect from the general condition of publishing at that time that the printing of so obscure and unlikely a volume by an equally unknown and unlikely author would require a certain amount of financing by the author or by private means. In any event, in 1850, the book was published. And for a book of its kind, and for the condition prevailing, it must have done fairly well, for in a few weeks over a hundred copies were sold. A hundred copies of a book of this nature was not bad. Some of the best philosophical works of English literature by well-known authors did not have this sale in this length of time. Then, for no reason known to anybody, South wrote a letter to the publisher forbidding the sale of any further copies. He then paid 250 pounds of good old-fashioned English money at the time when a pound was five dollars to buy up all remaining copies. These he had delivered to the small town where he lived and piled on the front lawn of his home. On the top of the pile he placed his own manuscript, which no one had ever seen, his poem on alchemy. And with the obvious approval and uh, consent of his daughter, they made a bonfire of the whole thing, burning all copies. If... Uh, he had done this, obviously against his daughter's wishes, it might have been suspected that some situation had arisen which made him feel that the project was dangerous for her. But as it was, she was in full accord in this bonfire of the books on the front lawn. 
Not only is this true, but she made every possible effort to secure back every copy that had been sold. And at a time when books were selling for a few cents or a few shillings at the most, she paid as much as fifty dollars to get back a single copy. What she did with the copies is also very interesting. She made them into sort of two stacks, one of which she very carefully went through, correcting mistakes and typographical errors in the printed book, and these she kept. Why, we do not know. And the copies which she did not so annotate, she also destroyed. For one reason or another, therefore, approximately half of the books that she was able to get back were destroyed. Why the selection, we do not have any idea. In accordance with this same policy, <coughs> we have examined the book with great care to try to discover whether there were in these erratas or mistakes which she corrected any justification for the destruction of the book. We're not able to find anything bad enough uh, to warrant such an action. Certainly there were a number of typographical errors, but these errors did not sufficiently interfere with the meaning of the book to justify its extinction on such ground. Efforts have been made to determine, in as far as possible, how many of the first edition of this book probably survived. There is no real way of being sure. We know that at the time the books were burned, only about a hundred copies were left. How many she succeeded in getting back, we do not know. Some think she probably was able, in the course of her lifetime, which was a very long one, to have reclaimed perhaps half of them, maybe a few more. Those that had reached permanent place in museums or libraries, or had gone out of the country, or were buried in collections to which she had no access, of course could not be uh, destroyed or annotated. Some my writers, trying to put the story together, feel that as few as ten copies, and perhaps as many as fifty, may have survived. That in all probabilities, the actual number is somewhere between these two classifications. The uh, effort to really find out why this sudden change of mood in the South household runs against a number of possibilities. First, and the story that was most early circulated, is to the effect that the destruction was the result of the displeasure of the Church of England. However, there is no actual proof of this. And had they been sufficiently orthodox, uh, to have fulfilled such a demand, even if it had been made, it is difficult to imagine why uh, Miss South would have bought these books back and kept half of them. If she had destroyed every one of them, it might be considered an act of extraordinary piety or fanaticism of some kind, but this she did not do. She did keep some, and in her later years she did give away some of those that she kept, inscribing them to personal friends. So the religious equation is not very sound. The second guess, and this was the one that uh, gained favor around the turn of the present century, is that these two people had suddenly become, become convinced that they had exposed or revealed too much of a very deep secret which it was not wise for the public to possess. In other words, that they had gone so far into the esoteric side of alchemy 
that it was possible to take the instruction and the intimations which they had left and make discoveries in the fields of chemistry that could be dangerous or could be perverted uh, to the evil of mankind. This is a possible hypothesis. But as we read the book and read it very carefully, there seems to be some doubt as to whether this is a likely explanation. The average person, even of scholarly mind, would not get too far in trying to perfect some practical work of alchemy by these uh, instructions or by the information contained in the book. It is also to be remembered that neither Mr. South or his daughter ever attempted any actual chemical or alchemical experiments. They had no laboratory. They are not known to have possessed any alchemical materials of any kind. It was purely a literary work. So that uh, the idea that they had fallen upon some great secret of chemistry is a little far-fetched also. A third suggestion has been made that in the course of their further study they had come across something which they felt invalidated the book they had written. Uh, there is a certain uh, point made in this volume uh, relating to mesmeric transmission of knowledge. Also there is a considerable study into the secrets of light. Uh, particularly as light uh, relates to the esoteric currents of the human body. It is possible that this phase of the uh, writing, uh, as some have suspected, was verging very closely toward Indian yoga. Perhaps they then at some time secured books on the subject of yoga and felt that their own presentation either was not consistent with the yoga of India or for some reason that the uh, value of the book was injured by their increasing knowledge of Indian philosophy. This point is sub of some interest because in the closing years of her life Mrs. Atwood was known, or then Miss South, was known uh, to have been interested in theosophy and a large part of her personal library, which was her father's library, uh, was finally turned over by her to the Theosophical Society during the presidency of Mr. Sinet. This is another phase that doesn't necessarily solve much, but it is, it is interesting and curious. Another point that might, might be rather intriguing there are some old accounts and records of Miss South during her growing years and during her early womanhood. The reports tell us that she was an exceedingly quiet, very attractive, and totally feminine person. Uh, she was a very domestic in consciousness with a great love of home and family. There is nothing whatever to indicate that she was sophisticated or an intellectual by uh, artificial attainments. And after the death of her father, she settled down to the quiet life of the wife of an English vicar and uh, remained in the capacity of assisting her husband in the ordinary works of the vicarage gaining a great reputation for her humbleness, for her gentleness, and for her constant thoughtfulness of the needs of common and ordinary people. With the exception of this one episode, there is no unusual indication that she was a woman of serious scholarly interests. One point, however, is noted, namely that to the end of her life she had a phenomenal memory. Uh, that she could draw forth out of herself a tremendous quantity of information on various subjects. But from the time she married the vicar 
to the time of his death, many years later, it is not probable that one person belonging to that particular community, church, would have ever suspected that she had ever heard of alchemy. There was no revival of this interest at any time during life, and no effort uh, to progress her own studies any further. There is another interesting little fragment uh, to the effect that she frequently told friends and associates that she never wanted another edition of the book to be printed. Yet other friends and associates whom she discussed the matter with report that she did say that at some time in the future another edition was be, would be likely. Uh, none, however, appeared during her lifetime. Three reprints of the book have been made, uh, the last rather recently. The reprints are also relatively scarce and hard to come by. When the first reprint appeared, the esoteric world of uh, scholarship uh, immediately rose in high dudgeon and reported that the new edition had been expurgated. This was what everyone really wanted to hear, because it would support the old idea that the book had been withdrawn because it contained information regarded as too delicate or too advanced to be entrusted to the public. I have taken the editions, however, and compared them minutely, and the idea that expurgation is a factor in the reprints is just plain foolishness. Uh, the only changes have been the corrections which she made on her own annotated copies, which are usually due uh, to a typographical error, or in a few instances she improved upon her own translations from Greek and Latin authors. So it would be totally wrong to assume that the so-called reprints are essentially defective. Uh, the reprints are just as trustworthy as the origi original edition, perhaps more trustworthy unless the original copy happens to have her handwritten corrections. So the fact that she was at one time adverse to the reprinting of the book and at a later time was quite content to contemplate a re-edition, here again we make very little sense. Uh, nothing seems to fit together or mean anything. After the episode of burning the edition and the father's poem on the front lawn of the house, uh, the interest in alchemy seems to have waned even in the intimate association of father and daughter. There is a report that this timing coincided closely with an evangelical revival in the Anglican Church, and therefore perhaps uh, the, the local condition was swept with a burst of orthodoxy. But uh, here again, it doesn't make very much sense. These two people were obviously intelligent persons, and the author of the uh, Hermetic Mystery uh, as it now comes down to us, is evidently emancipated uh, from such foolishness, so we must assume that this could not be the real answer. In any event, after this episode, the father-daughter association remained as congenial and close as ever, but there was apparently no further literary activity. There does not seem to have been much use of the library from that point on. And after a few years, Thomas South passed on. Uh, the death of her father, as the daughter herself tells us, was really the end of her entire intellectual career in uh, abstract matters. In some way, her entire focus depended upon her father. Under the tremendous stimulation of his mind, her own mental activity was greatly increased. 
the challenge of his thinking was what sharpened her own. And when he no longer was there to lead the questioning, to throw in the powerful uh, ideas, uh, she apparently had no longer any incentive or interest in continuing these intellectual studies. Now, when she married uh, this Anglican vicar, the Reverend Atwood, she evidently took with her most of her library. The new vicar himself was by no means an ignorant man. He was quite a scholarly person and seems to have also had a considerable interest in early forms of psychology as this subject existed in his day, was concerned over psychic phenomena and also to a measure was well read in philosophy. Therefore, she evidently found a man of um, interesting mind and a congenial life work. His church was in a rural community, and the responsibilities of his position were those of a country clergyman. He had to uh, keep up a pastoral duty, and in those days a clergyman's wife was very important to him. She had to carry on a large part of the social activity of the parsonage. Uh, this she performed admirably until his death, which he continued to live in the same house with her books, which apparently now she never read, still remaining a very beautiful, very gracious, very timid person. In her older years, uh, her appearance grew more spiritual, more mystical, and more strangely and sweetly childish. And she finally passed on of no disease or sickness that is known at the advanced age of 92 years. This is the story of our author. It makes absolutely no rhyme or reason when compared to the book. It does not appear that such a work would have been possible to her. That under the powerful inspiration of her father and with an extraordinary library available to her, uh, almost anything could be possible. But this is not a paste pot job. This is not the th superficial skimming of an avid reader. Uh, this is the kind of a book which might itself have been written by a medieval alchemist. It is a book of profound erudition, skillfully developed. It is a book that seems to tie us uh, to earlier centuries. It is a product out of time. In this work, the author indicates not only a knowledge of practically every important text of alchemy, but an intimate psychological insight into that text. This was not a person who merely read while they ran, but a careful scholar, carefully annotating and documenting everything that she used. Uh, the um, a further question has therefore been asked, did this book actually run afoul of one of the bona fide or real esoteric orders in England or Europe? Was its discontinuance due to the fact that pressure was brought from some level not easily available uh, for our consideration? Some have felt that this is the only answer, that this book either was produced under the direction of some esoteric organization or was not finally approved by that organization or was regarded as revealing too much. In any event, whatever was required was performed, and we might understand that uh, the sentimental authoress might like to keep a few copies under those conditions. Whatever it was, it is really a very astonishing story. Uh, also, of course, the question has risen, why was the work published anonymously? There are many uh, possibilities in this direction. 
it would appear that the poem which Mr. South had intended to publish would also have appeared anonymously. Certainly there is no name on the title page. Some feel that Miss South believed that to sign Mary Ann South on the title page of a book uh, of this nature would not have assisted its sale in England at that time. Books of this type were not supposed to be written by women. But this offered no particular real difficulty because she could have certainly signed the title page M.A. South and no one would have known whether it was a man or a woman. So this really doesn't actually solve anything. In the opening sections of uh, her work and throughout it, as far as that is concerned, uh, the author shows a peculiar and interesting devotion to two outstanding English thinkers. One was Mr. Thomas Taylor, the great English Platonist, who was a contemporary and whom she might well have known. She quotes his translations from the Greek and uses much of his material in her restoration of the Bacchic and Eleusinian rites, which she also interprets alchemically. She also quotes quite frequently and with considerable respect the writings of Lord Bacon. She seemed to sense in his effort at the restoration of knowledge a program which fitted into her own alchemical speculation. Uh, her interests, even within this range of alchemy, are highly diversified. Uh, she evidently made good use of Latin authors not generally available. Uh, she showed some skill, but not too great a penetration, in her translations. And it was among these that she made many of her corrections and annotations. But uh, the work, undoubtedly, is the most learned uh, volume on the subject of alchemy, written after the decline of the great alchemical schools themselves in the 17th century. Nothing approaching it has been produced in modern literature. And we are happy that we have in our library one of the original copies of the work, also one that was annotated by uh, Mary Atwood, or Mary South Atwood herself. As might be expected, it's uh, not in the finest possible condition. These books don't stay that way because they are books that are considerably read. But it is a good sound copy, and in itself it has some interesting features about it. First thing is, originally, for some reason, the book was sealed. In other words, these, this page, uh, following an old English and European system, was tied with cords, and the entire work was sealed together by this means. It's rather a complicated way of sealing, but it is known on a good many uh, books dealing with esoteric subjects. On the title, um, on the blank flyleaf, it says to CCM initials from MAA. That would be Mary Ann Atwood, February 22nd, 1886. This is one of the copies that she gave to a friend. Now, as I said, Mr. South's poem never saw the light of day. It went out of the bonfire with uh, all of the published books. Uh, but evidently, the publisher of the volume we have had been selected to publish his work also. And there is a note on the last page that the book will be published shortly. And in this particular case, it uh, tells us that the book will be The Enigma of Alchemy and Oedipus Resolved, a poem in five parts designed to elucidate the fables, symbols, and other mythological disguises in which the hermetic art has been enveloped and signalized in various ages. It's quite a long and uh, 
complete title page here. This is the one, the book that went up in fire. No one ever saw a copy of it. Now the uh, title of our own volume here, uh, published by Trelawney Saunders in London at Charing Cross in 1850, is a suggestive inquiry into the Hermetic Mystery with a dissertation on the more celebrated of the alchemical philosophers and an attempt toward the recovery of the ancient experiment of nature. This is followed by a Latin quotation attributed to Hermes. The book itself fulfills in every way the serious and scholarly title page which uh, opens into it. The table of contents is impressive in the extreme, and uh, it really has to be thoroughly read or studied in order to be fully appreciated. It begins with a preliminary account of the Hermetic philosophy with the more salient points of the public history. This is followed by the theory of the transmutation in general and of the first matter of the stone. The second or third section is the golden treatise of Hermes Trismegistus concerning the physical secret of the philosopher's stone in seven sections, and so on through the entire book. And you will see that this is hardly a young lady's diary. It shows, uh, some writers have said, that Mrs. Atwood used in this work uh, a skillful knowledge of more than a thousand of the most rec recondite authors on the subject. How she accomplished the book in the length of time she is supposed to have used is also a bit of a riddle, because works of this nature are not quickly done. The um, outline we've given you exhausts just about all that we know about Mary Ann Atwood. The rest of her story has to be from the book itself, which certainly indicates the thinking of her mind when she was between 30 and 33 years old, and uh, tells us probably about all that she achieved in her exploration into the Hermetic Mystery. So rather than to attempt the rather tedious problem of quoting the numerous authors which she mentions, and her own uh, rather archaic way of explaining them, I think the best thing we can do is to summarize some of her findings as these are of interest today in students of the Hermetic Arts. The primary assumption that she has and through which she develops her material is that alchemy always was a spiritual art. That beneath the stories and fables of the transmutation of metals was the primary purpose from the beginning, namely the transmutation of man's own nature. She was among those who caught the works of Roger Bacon and uh, Flamel and Maya and others who insisted that the entire story of alchemy was really a philosophical account of regeneration. That under the symbolism of metals and of chemical procedures, an exact spiritual art was unfolded that this art was unfolded not only uh, in the writings of the alchemists, but that the same key that unlocked these writings would unlock the mythologies, legendary, and lore of the ancients, that these secrets were identically those of Pythagoras, of the Eleusinian and Bacchic mysteries of Greece, and that these same mysteries and these same secret instructions were contained both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that the story of the life of Christ is itself a hermetic alchemistical fable. Now here you can see how 
she might have gotten into a little difficulty with the Anglican Church. They might not have seen eye to eye with her, but on the other hand, as she unfolds her uh, information, she does it in a very reverent and very deep manner. She indicates a, a very definite religious nature. And there is nothing in the uh, writing itself which is disrespectful of theology. Rather, it is an effort to penetrate uh, beneath the surfaces of all beliefs and all principles and all doctrines. In the beginning, uh, all of these different systems of hermetic and alchemical uh, teachings have dealt with the first matter of the stone. They have dealt with something which represented a universal primordial agent. Uh, Flamel and Ripley and Roger Bacon, the Benedictine Hermetist, all declared that the material, the base substance of the stone, the stone now being the alchemical process. But according to Mrs. Atwood, this is also the stone which the builders rejected, which became the head of the corner. This is the mysterious little sling stone with which David slew the great Goliath. And this is the rock which, striking the feet of the great vision image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, brought the whole image tumbling down. This mysterious primordial matter of the stone is everywhere. It is the most common thing we know. It is to be found in every part of the world. It is as abundant in the possession of the poor as of the rich. It can be grasped by the newborn babe and is one of the last things to be touched by the dying person in age. This, therefore, this mysterious universal agent of the stone, is the first subject of Mrs. Atwood's inquiry. And she comes to a number of interesting conclusions, of which the most simple is that this material is known to us, recognized by us, and understood by us by the simple term of light. Now, what is light? To us, light is something that we can uh, use to add up grocery bills or see how to get through traffic. But according to the deepest thinking of the world, perhaps light is still an absolute mystery. At least uh, Mrs. Atwood felt that although we may be able to define light, we may be able to uh, discover certain uh, definitions relating to how light comes into existence and what its powers and forces are, that the substance of light, like the very substance of nature itself, is a secret of secrets that transcends even the deepest of our thinking. Light, as Paracelsus pointed out, is of more than one kind. There is a light which shines upon the body. There is a light by means of which we can see physically in this world all the things around us. Then there is a light in the heart of man, which lights up with a kind of mystical comprehension. There is a lightness which is the brightness of our spirits. There is the light of reason. There is the light of truth. There is the light of God. There is light in all of the various works of men. And as one of the alchemists says, our labor is a labor of light. The alchemical mystery then has to do with this universal agent of light. Light everywhere present, nowhere understood. Light which of course bears witness. For this is the light which bears witness to the life. And this life in turn becomes light. And this light is the life of men. 
and uh, one of the great alchemical mysteries, according to our author, is, is locked within the opening verses of the first chapter of St. John. If then the great work of alchemy is founded upon light, then it means that light in itself is the great transmuting, transmuting agent that the thing that man must discover, the man, that man must search for everlastingly is the mystery of the inner light locked within the base elements of his own nature. Light, therefore, uh, becomes the open door to the shut palace of the king. It becomes the secret entrance to the cave of Zoroaster and uh, the story of the twelve keys of Basilis Valentinus. Now it is not common light with which we are concerned, but the essence of light, the mystery of that light which is concealed within all things. This light may be considered a fluid. It may be considered a gaseous substance. It may be considered as shapeless and formless. And it may also be considered as merely the extension of a substance uh, of which it is the radiance, as the light pouring from the sun is really the extension of the molten mass of the solar orb itself. So light arises from this great moltenness of the sun. And our alchemical mystery is concerned with how the light of the sun the tremendous combustion of the solar orb can and does result in the atmosphere of a solar system being impregnated with a vitality by which all elements and substances become fruitful. It might give us a little reason to pause as to why the terrible combustion upon the sun should make plants to grow upon the earth how it is that this fiery mass should result in all the beauties of the nature that we know. That from this strange mystery, which seems to be only luminance, there must also arise the eternal nutrition of all things that have their substance in light. Light, therefore, is its own food containing within it the mystery of the supporting of all creatures that are dependent upon it for existence. Consequently, this light is not merely something that shines from a candle or a lantern, or perhaps it is the same thing. But this light produces results. This light affects things. This light changes things. It fades color when man artificially applies color. But it preserves color when nature provides that coloring. This light uh, warms the harvest, brings things to their fruitfulness, and paints the color of the apple with all its radiance and glow. This light, then, is not just something. This light is a particular thing. And it is a symbol of an all-pervading combination of enlightenment and nutrition. It is the agent by which all of the works of nature are brought to ripeness. Therefore, in some way, light must be necessary to the ripeness of the human being, to the maturity of his soul and to the unfoldment and spiritualization of his consciousness. You can understand that it wouldn't take much leading along this direction uh, to bring these two people, Mr. South and his daughter, close to the threshold of the theory of magnetism, which is the exchange of some mysterious uh, energetic fluid within the body called at that time the insensible perspiration. 
It was believed that in magnetism a certain energy uh, uh, passed from the operator to the patient, and that this energy performed a certain catharsis in the patient, uh, cleared out the obstructions of disease, regenerated and revitalized the body, and strengthened the functions thereof. The, the uh, author of the Hermetic Mystery then looks into the air for the mining of the great energy substances, feels definitely that all the materials necessary for the perfection of life are to be found in light, that it is light ultimately that will feed us, will heal us, will enlighten us, will liberate our psychic natures just as surely as it will sustain our physical life and growth. So the beginning of the mystery has to do with the search for and the control of the light agent. And she proceeds then to uh, go into all of the different types of religious symbolism, the ancient rites and rituals of the Greeks, the Persians, and even occasionally touching upon the more Asiatic peoples to discover what is really meant by light. What is this effulgency that shines upon the mystic in his illumination? What is the magnificent light of the transfiguration mentioned in the New Testament? What is this glory upon the, the heads of saints? What were the flames of Pentecost? What is this mysterious light that shone underground in the Egyptian temples? What is this strange luminous power that is even captured by insects and creatures of the sea by which they are capable of becoming radiant? And we are now told that in the depths of the ocean there is no darkness because these deeper parts are filled with radiant creatures that create their own light. All of this thinking seemed, therefore, to suggest a study, in terms of alchemy, of the nature of light itself. Light not only being the source of life, but the ultimate end into which life itself is dissolved. For if there be corruption upon the earth, corruption due to death or decay, light will purify it. If water is polluted, light will cleanse it. Wherever light exists in sufficient amount, it will clean or restore or purify anything with which it comes in contact. Now in the study of alchemy, the types or kinds of light have to be considered. And the alchemist did believe definitely that there, were, there was light within man. Paracelsus says that all the constellations are to be found within the psychic field of the human body. Therefore, that man is indeed a creature radiant with light. And the woman who went into the wilderness to bear her son was surrounded and clothed by the sun. This light that moves from man, found everywhere in his constitution, forms a sort of magnetic field around the body. Later, uh, 19th century metaphysicians were to think of this light as the auric field of the body. They realized that man is continually radiating from his own centers a peculiar kind of highly qualified light. That this light forms a transcendent body. That this light might well be uh, symbolized by the robes of glory of the high priest of, Il of Israel or the mysterious light of the hierophant of Egypt who stood upon the porch of the temple uh, clothed in blue and gold, the symbols of light. These light symbols, evidently to these researchers, implied that man's own nature is a constantly radiant field 
and that within the field of this nature uh, a great chemistry is set up. Uh, many of the early alchemical experiments are described or shown as taking place within glass bottles. These glass bottles or, or uh, jars are usually roughly circular uh, with uh, a short neck so that they are like globes rather than the common type of slender bottles that we know at the present time. They were chemists' bottles, and these bottles and retorts have been long used. But all the experiments of the emetic art must take place within these bottles. It is here that, uh, accompanied by an appropriate degree of heat, uh, by a sand furnace or a water furnace, or by being buried uh, as the ancient Egyptians buried their alchemical retorts in heaps of dung, the heat of which in their uh, process of decay or putrefaction created heat. And this heat was used uh, to preserve a certain kind of temperature which was needed in these experiments. All of this, Mrs. Atwood, feels definitely refers to processes taking place within man. That the magnetic field of the human body is this retort. And that within this retort, elements represented uh, in terms of the magnetic field as colors, forms, numbers, patterns, and designs are in constant motion and mutation that man's psychic field is therefore this alchemical bottle, and that every instinct and every emotion and thought of his nature uh, is represented to those who have inner vision or clairvoyant sight by the changes in the colors and motions of the liquids, fluids, mystery, or mysterious gases that seem to fill this magnetic field. Uh, this perhaps leads us gradually in the direction of some modern thinking. The uh, human magnetic field suggests very closely the psychological subjective field of man's personality. We know that man, uh, as a psychic entity, is in constant chemical activity within his own soul that the soul therefore may be regarded as in the process of the accomplishment of the great experiment of transmutation. That in some way the entire mystery of alchemy has to be played out in the psychic life of man. That this psychic world in which man inwardly exists must be passed through the peculiar rotations or disciplines imposed upon the metals in alchemical symbolism. That the great experiment, therefore, is the transmutation within man of the diversified elements of his own psychic nature. That these elements are represented by the seven base elements involved in the Hermetic mystery that these elements represent perhaps the testimony of the sensory perceptions. They represent possibly the entire area of man's psychic subjectivity. They represent all the forces that play in upon man through his faculties, through his powers, and through the extension of his mind in its various areas. Thus perhaps these elements correspond to the Buddhist skandhas. For actually, what we call self, or personal consciousness, is a chemical compound arising in the psychic field. Man's personality is actually the sum of the condition of the base elements of his own personality. Thus the soul is a chemical or alchemical product. The, the great process of transmuting the products of the sensory perception into soul power must take place in man continuously. 
This is another point which brought great comfort and consolation to the alchemists of old, and also uh, Mrs. Atwood becomes aware of it and gives it some thought. The greatest transmutations imaginable, far more extraordinary than the universal medicine of Paracelsus or Theophrastus. The wonderful and strange experiments that defy all human thinking are taking place constantly in the human body. There is nothing more mysterious in the alchemical texts than the mystery of digestion and assimilation in man. There is nothing more wonderful than how food is changed gradually within the stomach into all of the subjective energies necessary for the maintenance of the body. The stomach is the greatest alchemist we have ever conceived of. Yet these processes in nature, being natural, reasonable, and orderly, they seem to tell us that with nature everything is possible. And just as there are laws by which digestion is possible, so these laws operating in space can be understood and can be applied to other related or pra uh, practical purposes. The very principle which makes it possible for man to live at all is the pr principle which, when properly understood, will enable man to live well. Thus man himself becomes and is an alchemist, really whether he knows it or not. But the bringing through of this knowledge into his awareness in a way that he can control it so that by art he can perfect nature enables him to perform the great work. So uh, Mrs. Atwood tells us obviously that the great work is a simple fact and that this great work is the perfection of the consciousness of man by means of which this consciousness ultimately retain, uh, regains its universal completeness and is reunited with its divine source. Great work is the production of the heavenly man, the production, the production of the universal true principle, which is the elixir of eternal life because it bestows immortality. It is the transmuter of all base metals because it provides the means by which every material element of man's compound nature is transformed into its spiritual equivalent. And it is also the symbol of the removing of the flaws from precious stones and the manufacturing of artificial gems. Uh, the precious stones and the artificial gems relate particularly to man's psychic field where these stones, like the pearl of great price and the rose diamond of the rosy cross, all represent the sole attributes of man, the shining adornments which uh, exist within his own nature. Just as surely also as the sun grail or the holy grail, the cup of the blood of the king is the human heart, containing as it does the blood of the king or the blood of life. So this uh, Holy Grail is likewise the ancient symbol of the alchemical vessel in which the transmutation takes place. Therefore this uh, transmutation is also a Holy Eucharist. It is the mysterious transformation of the blood and wine into the life and body of Christ. All the legends and fables bearing upon these things have arisen in the consciousness of man who is dimly aware of a mystery which he has consciously forgotten. But locked within himself, man is aware, as Omar so well says, that from his base metals must be filed the key that shall unlock the door they howl without. That actually in man himself is the whole of the Hermetic Mystery. That all these books are therefore veiled accounts attempting to preserve down through the corruptions of uh, world conditions 
the same esoteric doctrine that was taught in the sanctuaries of Greece and Egypt and India. Yet a new language has been developed and devised. And now Ms. Atwood points out one of the interesting and important parallels. Namely, that this new language that was developed by the alchemists and was gradually taken over by the chemists is the language of a scientific salvation. That in these formulas and rituals, it is no longer simple piety that accomplishes the works. That man is actually capable of a voluntary cooperation with nature in the advancement of all of the works of light. She then has it something that may seem a little difficult for us to comprehend, but I believe that basically she is right. Namely, that the works of light possible to man include not only the improvement of his own nature, but ultimately the regeneration of his world. That actually these works of man represent the power to use light, not only to cleanse the body, the soul, and the spirit, but to cleanse all of nature, to cleanse the air, the earth, the fire. That it is perfectly possible for man to charge the very energy fields of his planet just as he is charged himself by these fields. And that man, by the uh, development and perfection of his own life, makes all things new again in the world around him. And in this way fulfills the promise that from his own righteousness there shall come a new heaven and a new earth. That the alchemical mystery, therefore, is a kind of chain reaction and we are beginning to uh, appreciate that such a thing might be conceivable when we begin to think in terms of nuclear physics. We are now in the position where we realize the tremendous energy forces uh, can be loosed, which have an incredible and unknown effect upon not only living things, but upon the very fountains of life, the sources of the energies and the powers with which we are concerned. And perhaps Mrs. Atwood would have been very much impressed had she been able to live to realize that in the fission of the atom we have a proof of the release of infinite life light power from one tiny, almost incredibly small source. We also know that the fission that we have now achieved is only a very partial fission and that in all probability there is enough energy in each atom to perfect or destroy an entire solar system, all depending upon use. And use is moral alchemy. Use is the power which arises in man by means of which he becomes a gardener in the garden of the metals by which he becomes the faithful guardian of the tree of life, upon which grow the stars of all the metals in the Museum Hermeticum. Also, Mrs. Atwood has come to the conclusion that this process must be a completely orderly and exact one. That somewhere along the line in the destruction and decline of the mysteries, those aspects of alchemy which were truly scientific were relatively lost. Uh, one of the uh, German princes uh, finally imprisoned an alchemist and set him to work to find the secret of uh, the transmutation of metals. This alchemist never succeeded but among the experiments which did succeed was the discovery of the formula for Dresden, China. And as a result, this particular king became a very rich and powerful man without the transmutation of metals. And the whole history of alchemy and chemistry has been a history of byproducts. The search for the elixir of life has enriched our pharmacopoeia, has given us numerous devices and inventions, has led to such discoveries as illuminating gas, 
and things of this kind. And there were things found along the way by men searching for something else. But it is interesting that in their search along the way they found practical, valuable, and useful things. That they discovered the operations of law. And therefore that it might not be entirely fair to say that chemistry is the same son of alchemy and mad mother. Actually, all of these uh, chemical experiments were based upon certain convictions. But as Mrs. Atwood points out, somewhere along the line, the direct course was lost. Somewhere in the course of man's existence, he began uh, to look around him uh, for a means of applying knowledge. And in this, Mrs. Atwood quotes from the Instauratio Magna of Lord Bacon, in which his lordship points out that man, in the course of time, has learned to apply wisdom to almost everything except himself. He has taken skill and turned it to breeding better cattle or raising more grain to the acre. But he has forgotten in the course of this to turn his skill within himself to the improvement of his own being. This was the difference between alchemy and chemistry, essentially. Chemistry as we know it today is, dev is devoted to experimenting with the elements of nature. Alchemy with the elements of nature in man. Always man has had a tendency to look out from himself toward other things and to take the energies which he possesses and direct them to the victory over other things. However, the very laws by which man hopes ultimately to conquer the world are the same laws by which man must finally learn to conquer himself. And alchemy points out that if man first achieves uh, the kingdom of heaven or the transmutation within himself, then all other things will be added to him. Where it is said of the powder of the red lion, which is the great powder of the projection of metals, that it will transform into perfect gold 100,000 times its own weight. This undoubtedly refers to something. Uh, we can say that insight turned upon the unknown will transform a hundred thousand times its own mass of ignorance into truth. The virtue will transform many, many times its own mass into common good. In any event, however, uh, the problem was to apply uh, a knowledge of exactitudes toward the great problem, and that is man. Why is this so essentially necessary? Why cannot we ultimately win by simply putting the world in order around man and then permitting man to enjoy this fruit of his own labor? The answer is pretty obvious that all the changes that occur in the world must first arise within man. Therefore, man cannot ex perfect the experiment in nature until he has perfected it in himself. He can continue his undisciplined struggle with nature. He can continue this effort to overwhelm nature by skill alone. But without directive, without insight, without consciousness concerning ways, means, and ends, without vision, the people perish. And without having within his own nature the achievement of the magnum opus or the great work, it is impossible for man to direct nature, to control it, or to turn it to the fulfillments of its own purpose. Until man knows the end, he cannot lead nature to that end. Thus, in some mysterious way, the great experiment must first be performed in man and then in the world. These are the two great laboratories, the laboratory of the human soul and the laboratory of the cosmos. 
Well, whenever the rule is found actually and absolutely in one, it will be applicable to the other. Whereas Hermes Trismegistus has written, that which is above is the same as that which is below. That which is the lesser is the same as that which is the greater. For all things are bound together by the law of analogy. In this uh, pattern then, the search for the inward transmutation must be a search after a science. A science of the handling, the directing, the multiplying, the expanding, the extending, and the transforming of light. This light must come into man, for this light must make reason possible to man. For reason is mind plus light. Love is heart plus light. Strength, even of body, is physical resource plus light. The mystical experience is dedication and devotion plus light. Light must always be the agent of all these things. And if this light be lifted up, it will draw all things to it. And this light is the light which cometh into the world, and lighteth every man who cometh into the world. So the problem, again, is the magnificent chemistry of light. Now, it is obvious that uh, the Atwoods were moving very closely toward the Indian concept of yoga, that they were sensing uh, the same light principle that is also to be found in Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, the, the world of the radiance of truth, the world of the eternal light uh, in which all things live and move and have their being. Now how is this light to be made available? The alchemist said that it had to be extracted from darkness. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So the base substances seen in the alchemical retort have to do with light hidden in darkness. Just as gold is hidden in the base metals of the earth, just as the light which the small plant takes from the ground comes from the dark mother in which its roots are placed. So everywhere in the darkness of earth there is life, and this life makes things grow. And the vitality and life and nature must in some way uh, be discovered and separated from darkness. It must be as in the opening chapters of Genesis, which according to Mrs. Atwood, absolutely recapitulate the entire alchemical process, and that any chemist thoroughly understanding the first chapter of Genesis can actually transform base metals into gold, physically as well as spiritually. Because in this, or in this section is contained the summary of creation, and this summary of creation is the key to the continuance of creation. For in the world of the metals, creation is forever. In the world of God, creation is continuous. Uh, creation is not something that started and then suddenly ceased, and only the products went on. The very processes of Genesis are being repeated every instant, and will be to the end of existence. For constantly, creation is unfolding itself. Constantly, light is descending into darkness, and darkness, in its fullness of term, is releasing light again by the mystery of the second birth. So each person is searching for light. And how is he going to find it? How is he going to make this exploration into the dark mystery of base matter in order to extract light? In addition to light itself, what is the most common base matter of our existences? Uh, not uh, now uh, in terms of physical materials, 
but in terms of that which we all have in common. One answer is that we all have the base material of living. Living is something that happens to everything that is alive. Everything that has life right in it lives. Therefore, living is in some way an unfolding of the life-light principle. So each person lives every day. He lives according to his knowledge, according to his insight or the lack thereof. He lives well or badly, according to his own instincts, his selfishness, his nature, and according to the mysterious uh, impulses which plague his psychic integration. But uh, there is this common matter of life or living, and we may call it experience. For experience is really nothing more than the gathering up of the treasures of the light. And these are the treasures which thieves cannot break in and steal, nor rust destroy. So each day, whether we are aware of it or not, we are experiencing something. And every experience is an experiment in light. Everything that happens to us has a right meaning, but this does not always mean that we know what that meaning is. But into our own reservoirs, our capacities, are stored away these works of the light. And uh, Bacon refers to these also by the same general theme the works of light. Now the works of light in nature result in growth and purification. The works of light in the experience of man result in a form of knowledge, a form of self-education continuously going on in nature. Everything that man does teaches him something, only unfortunately man does not always know what he is taught. Therefore, he goes on uh, experiencing much and learning comparatively little. But nature preserves in the sudden conscious nature of man that which he has learned. And this becomes, so to say, a supply of crude ore. This is the supply of impregnated material. For in experience, the gold of value is hidden within the darkness of ignorance. And in the alchemical tradition, a dragon was fashioned to symbolize this. And in the Greek legend, this dragon wound itself around the tree of life on which hung the mysterious golden fleece. And it was to discover this golden fleece that Jason and the Argonauts made their great journey. And this was part of a ritual of initiation into the mysteries. So man's evolution, his process of existence down through time, has resulted in the gradual accumulation of a properly impregnated material. This material is in his memory. It is in his subjective thinking. It is in the background of everything that he is. This impregnated material is the basis of his career, his home, his business. It is the reason why he can pass an examination in school. It is the reason why he can fill out an application form when he wants a job. All of this building continuously of light in darkness leads us to the alchemical certainty that there is a continuous process going on in man in which the works of light are achieving victory over the works of darkness. And yet the light and the darkness are together and uh, they are not clearly divisible as Bilby points out. Somewhere the dawn or the break of the auroral light must come. And uh, Mrs. Atwood looks to the Hermetic mystery to try to understand these uh, wonderful occurrences. Uh, taking the alchemical thinking again, 
You come to such problems naturally as faith, understanding, dedication, discipline. You find that in the Hermetic mystery there has to be some mysterious agent, the active agent of the stone. Now the active agent of the stone is a kind of mordant. It is a catalyzing agent of some nature. And uh, in alchemy, faith plays very much this part. Because something has to stir uh, this compound, this compound uh, which lies in obscurity. Somewhere the Jason has to go forth and search for the golden fleece. Somewhere in, this, in man's nature there must gradually arise the conviction that there is a mystery and that this mystery can be solved. In ancient times, education included the clear statement of this simple fact, but modern education no longer does include any intimation that there is a mystery, or that it can be solved, or that there is a road or a way that leads uh, to the accomplishment of the universal medicine. So in uh, the alchemical tradition, actually strange names are given to familiar things. Yet these familiar things are not in themselves simple. They are not in themselves commonplace. Uh, we, we can say that it sounds uh, much of a come down that some elaborate alchemical material should turn out to be faith. But actually, we have no way of knowing the full dimension of faith. It is probably stronger and greater and more mysterious than any physical chemical or element we have ever explored. It is because certain words have lost their meaning, have lost their profundity, uh, that we, we do not recognize the value of valuable words. And one of the most valuable of these words is in itself faith. Faith has some kind of a transmuting power in life. Faith releases light into the soul, even as doubt obscures light. Now in alchemy also, there is always the ancient master. Alchemy constantly refers uh, to some strange wandering adept, some deeply versed and secret one who possesses the knowledge. In the Paracelsian corpus, this is called a Laius Artista, or a Laius the Artist, a kind of mysterious, immortal, wandering alchemist who never dies, who possesses the elixir of life, who has made the great transmutation, and goes around the world forever, selecting dedicated and faithful disciples, visiting them in their laboratories, and revealing to them the secrets of the arts when their own merits deserve such revelation. Who is the mysterious Elias Artista? The one master alchemist who never dies, who goes on and on, revealing to those who are ready the secret of the stone. One way of looking upon him is quite a simple way, and he is the alchemical tradition itself. He is the one who cannot die because he is a great conviction. He is a great mystery locked in human consciousness. But he appears only to those who are worthy. He makes himself known to the alchemist only when this alchemist has prayerfully dedicated his labors to truth and to light. Then he appears and gives the key to the mystery and then vanishes again and is seen no more. This represents uh, Mrs. Atwood's thinking, what we would almost term today the archetypal psychological teacher locked within our own consciousness and locked also within the consciousness of universals. In the root of every integration or organization that exists in nature is the mysterious fact of the immutable mathematical formula upon which that organization is based. Everything in the root of itself is instinctively a work of light. 
Everything has within its own nature the strange seal of its own identity. Elias the artist is perhaps partly tradition, partly the great story that has come down to us. Partly it is also the subconscious teacher in ourselves, the old one, the folk consciousness that we have. Perhaps it is descended to us in, in our blood, in our heredity. Perhaps it is the symbol of the infinite sequence of previous embodiments by which we have come to our present state. But it is the old one and the true one locked in us, locked in our conscious experience, and available only to us when we have ourselves performed the works of light. So the struggle or the labor always concerns with this. And now Mrs. Atwood goes into considerable detail in relation to Neoplatonism, quoting from Plotinus, Proclus, and many of the other mystics of North Africa and Athens, relating to uh, the works of light in terms of the motion of consciousness itself from ignorance to illumination. Illumination being, of course, the final absorption into light. A man's growth as an, as an emetic experience deals with the seven steps of the ladder of alchemy. And this ladder, the Escalade de la Sage, is in actuality the same as the seven steps of Bacon's mysterious ladder of the arts, or ladder of wisdom. In this, consciousness ascends through seven steps represented by the orbits of the planets, which are in turn the alchemical symbols of the elements. Therefore, as the metals and the elements are arranged upon a ladder, or to form the links of the golden chain of Homo, which bound Earth to the pinnacle of Olympus, so this ladder of the wise represents the seven ascending levels of human consciousness, by means of which man rises from ignorance to universal insight. All this, of course, is theoretically quite understandable, but the question always remains, how is it done? How is it physically, psychologically, or spiritually possible to perform this work? This becomes, of course, the difference between theoretical alchemy and practical alchemy. And it is the method of how this can be done and not the fact that it can be done, which constitutes the esoteric doctrine in the Hermetic Sciences. Uh, Mrs. Atwood senses this and realizes it, and tries in the light of the study of many of these deep works to put together a formula, a pattern, not now to be used chemically, although she believes, and most alchemists have taught, that the formula for the regeneration of man will also regenerate the metals. But to discover this mystical insight by means of which the human being can achieve the transmutation of his own consciousness from darkness into light, or to free the souls of the metals from their bodies in order that they may unite to form the universal medicine. Now all the alchemists have agreed upon one thing, namely that you cannot combine the souls of metals while these metals are in various conditions of their own development. You cannot take the outward bodies of elements and force these bodies together. You cannot take common lead and mingle it with iron and produce anything more than a kind of alloy of lead and iron. These two will not accept each other. They will not become actual uh, souls united. They will only be bodies united and souls in stress. Alchemy creates another symbol, the, the hermetic mercury the mysterious symbol of the universal solvent. Mercury is said to be the one element that will accept other elements into its own soul. 
Therefore, mercury becomes in a mysterious way in the alchemical tradition the symbol of Christ, because also it is the child of the sun and moon, of the offspring of heaven and earth. But even in the case of these elements, the alchemists tell us definitely that crude iron and crude silver cannot be united to produce the mystery. But before these elements can be combined, they must die. For unless the seed dies, says St. Paul, it shall not live again. Therefore, the mystery, like the mystery of the early Christian convert, is the mystery of the firstborn of them that sleep in death. The whole story has to be a story of resurrection. It has to be a story of the rolling away of the stone and of the empty, and the empty sepulcher. It is the story of that which has risen from its own mortality to become the eternal proof and hope of immortality for all creatures. For in the resurrection of Christ, said the old apostles, is the proof of the resurrection of all that lives. This in turn relating to the metals in the alchemical mystery is that the metals must die. They must be crucified. They must descend into darkness. They must pass into limbo, which is the retort, or the alchemical vessel. And here they must be caused to suffer, as in a purgatorial, which is a purging or cleansing. And here in the due course of time, they will ultimately be forgiven or restored by the descent of Christ into limbo for the salvation of souls. So now our alchemists tell us that these elements must die. And the question is, what are meant by these elements? I think that the Buddhist would answer that very simply, that these elements are the sensory perceptions and the mental focus. They are the elements that form the mysterious six-pointed star with the sun or self or sattva in the center, the mysterious shield of David of the Jewish Kabbalah. These representing then the psychic integration centers of man, representing the powers of the sensory perceptions. These must die in order that their own secret energy may be released again. So that by only by man's victory over the senses is the message or the power or the true reality that is locked in these senses, as in the basic matter, matter of experience. Only in this way can it be released. So we come to meditation, to Zen, uh, to practically any of the disciplines of Neoplatonism or the ancient Greeks. For the death of the sensory perceptions is simply quietude, meditation. The absolute relief of man, the pressure of the objective functions of his own composite nature. The man becoming still causes confusion to die in him. And it is the death of confusion that results in the rise of value. For when the confusion of the testimony of the senses has been stilled, then the wisdom that is locked in these senses becomes compatible and can mingle. Thus, when the senses and their functions are suspended, the principle of consciousness upon which they all depend is realized in its unity. In other words, the element, the principles, the energies of the senses' perceptions can be alchemically united as long as the senses themselves do not function. So by a complete suspension of the personal, the universal elements within us can come together. But while we continually disturb these elements by our own objective awareness, they cannot come together. Mrs. Atwood feels that this is the burden and part of the Eleusinian mystery ritual, 
and certainly of Neoplatonism, which is based thereon, and the Orphic Rhapsodies, that these tell the story of a mystical suspension of error and illusion, by means of which reality can reaffirm itself, by which the individual will find in principles these things which he cannot discover while he is addicted uh, to the shadows or appearances of things. Let us take a simple example of the point involved, namely take religion. We will imagine that an individual uh, is torn between religion and science. While religion is in its crystallized integration within himself, while religion in him is a series of specific beliefs, while religion has to do uh, with uh, the consubstantiation of the host, while religion has to do with the assumption of the virgin, while religion has to do with the co-eternity of the three persons of the Trinity. While these factors are in consciousness, religion is working in its own way, but it is not assumable with anything else. We go then over to science and we say the while this man is dedicated to biology, so that his universe moves around the center of axis of biological situation, or he is a physicist, or he is an astronomer, or he is dedicated to any of the works of the light of science. He is then not only involved, but by his own limitations imposed upon his own areas, he cannot even circumscribe the whole boundary of science. He is only working with a little area. A scientist thus engaged and preoccupied and a religionist thus engaged and preoccupied cannot meet. They can have certain superficial, friendly relationships, perhaps, but they have no identity, no conscious realization of each other. Yet if either of these was able to completely disassociate his consciousness from any aspect of his, react, uh, his labor or reactive work, and go to the substance of it. If the religionist could separate religion from theology, if the scientist could separate science from the sciences, in other words, perform this alchemical reduction to source, then science would realize that the substance upon which it is built is inevitable, immutable, universal law. And the religionist would discover that the substance upon which faith is built is inevitable and immutable universal law. In their principles, therefore, these two can unite. But once they have become structures, they cannot unite. This is why alchemy says that you have to destroy the outward forms of things. You have to calcinate them. You have to burn them, or corrupt them, or destroy them, until nothing of the body remains but ashes. Then the living spirit within these things can unite. For in all life there is an identity of truth light. And this identity of truth, uh, truth light is the secret of compatibility. And compatibility, or the union, or mingling, an identification of these elements finally represents the amalgam from which the great stone of the wise is projected by alchemy. So first, by the reduction of all things to their essences, they become susceptible of union. And out of the union of these divided elements comes the sudden re-experience of the unity of the archetype of life from which they descended the continual discovery of increasing unities, the ascent from particulars to generals, the gradual disintegration of the external natures of things and the reestablishment of their internals. In this way, the great alchemical transmutation takes place. 
This can be put in terms of chemistry and will probably operate chemically. It can be put in terms of religion and will operate religiously, or in terms of philosophy. But in man, the peculiar term of it is in the term of yogic consciousness searching. For the whole redemption of man lies in the reduction of the confusion or complexity of man to the absolute stillness, which is the death of the divided parts. And then from the death of, this, of these divided parts, a spirit rises. The spirit released from confusion, released from difference, from discord, and from the various vibratory patterns of elements, suddenly is restored to its own right, right nature. So in the alchemical tradition, again, the purpose is forever to reduce the bodily interference of things with the unfoldment of the life within body. The grand experiment is therefore to be attained in universal conscious re-identification with the infinite. This means the final elimination of the dross in all things, the transmutation of every base metal into principle the final falling away of all bodies, illusions, beliefs, creeds, sects, divisions, which exist primarily in the mental nature of man. When these fall away, when these are overcome, when these are relaxed and released so that they no longer interfere, then man gradually brings together the essences of all things. And in the reunion of essences within the living alchemical retort of his own soul, man achieves the great transmutation. He becomes the other. He becomes the yoga. He attains the samadhi. He becomes the embodiment of the entire discipline of antiquity, which had for its essential purpose the production of the man of light, the production of the luminous, androgen, the great complete composite being, uh, which is hidden from us by the confusion and complexity of our own mortal existence. So alchemy approached in this way is the burden of Mrs. Atwood's study. And I think as we proceed with it, we realize, and we will realize more as we read her work, the tremendous amount of thought and the tremendous amount of insight that went into it. We wonder at the strange story of how it was done. We know the universe works mysteriously. Perhaps in her we had some strange alchemical transmutation by which in the early years of the 19th century she was able to produce this work. In any event, it is a, dig a dignified and important volume, and certainly one of the worthiest to appear in the interpretation of the Hermetic Arts. Well, I think we'd better let you get your bus and go home now.